Good morning. It is nine o'clock Central Standard Time, uh, March the 9th, 2021, here at the Dallas Schools Environmental Education Center. We want to welcome you to our virtual field trip. A special welcome to the Booker T. Washington School for the Performing Arts of Dallas ISD. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not registered, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. Sign up. This is just for our attendance records only. This morning, we're going to do a program called Taxonomy. During this virtual field trip, students will recognize the importance of a standardized taxonomic system to the scientific community. They'll learn to categorize organisms uh, using hierarchical classification system based on similarities and differences shared among groups and compare characteristics of taxonomic groups. Ms. Nash will do a program called Early History. Ms. Fuller will tell you about the late history. Uh, Mr. Monroe will do classification and Ms. Ramirez will do about, will tell you all about groups. Uh, you cannot verbally talk to us during this program, but you can ask questions. Uh, if you go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC uh, space questions, space answer, and fill out your questions, we'll do our best to answer them during the program. If not, we'll send the answers to your teachers. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Ms. Nash is going to tell you all about the early history. Hello, welcome to my classroom. And today we're talking about taxonomy. So taxonomy is the system of organizing, naming, classifying, living, or well, anything really. But in this case, we're talking about plants and animals. So being able to group things and talk about things is as old as language itself. So we're gonna look at how it all began. We'll go back in time, way back in time. So as I said, taxonomy is as old as language, okay? So people, human beings, have lived as hunters and gatherers for 99% of the time we've been on the planet. So that means if we take all of human existence to 100 days, we've been the way we are now with agriculture and cities for one day. For 99% of our history, we lived in small groups and we hunted and gathered. That means we killed animals, we fished, and we gathered seeds and nuts and berries and roots and leaves to eat. That's how we survived. So that knowledge of plants and animals was, and in some, a few remaining hunting and gathering societies still is a matter of survival. So everything came from what we could find in the environment. Food, medicine, clothing, tools, shelter, everything okay, came from the environment. So we all had to be really good scientists. We had to be good botanists, good naturalists, experiment, find out what plant was good to eat, what would make you sick, where the animals would be, when they would be there, migration, seasons, all kinds of things, complicated things. So it turns out, although we often think of it as being the mammoth hunters or whether hunting buffalo or whatever, actually in women did most of the gathering of most of the calories of the day. And so that meant gathering fruits, seeds, and roots. It's often more important to survival than hunting. For this reason, knowledge of, of plants in particular, what season they would be available, what part of the plant to eat. So everybody had to be a good botanist. Okay? This detailed knowledge varied according, of course, to the environment where they were living and the resources available in that particular place. And this little bowl here in the picture is African, what they call bush tucker, meaning food from the, the countryside in Australia, where we don't think of a lot of things growing. We took at kangaroos, but in actual fact, the people that lived there for thousands and thousands of years had all kinds of things to dig up and gather to eat besides kangaroo meat. <clears throat> so they would put things into different categories. So this is one system of organization from the Okanagan 
First Nation people of British Columbia, Canada. And they've divided animals up into the fish, those that fly, those that walk with paws, and those that walk with hooves. So some of those categories are similar ones we have today. Then I had those that crawl on the ground, which included worms and snakes that we would probably not put in the same group. And then I had those without blood. And interestingly enough, Aristotle, who was talking about leather, had that same category, and that was insects and spiders. And then there's the plants. And again, some of those categories are similar to ones we use today. So trees with leaves and trees with needles. And then we had the grasses. And then, interestingly, there are two categories that involve the usefulness of those items. So because these plants were so important to survival, they would get their own category, roots that you could eat, and then berries. So in Western um, culture, European culture, um, we look to Aristotle, who proposed a system of two types of animals, those with blood and without blood, so basically the vertebrates and the invertebrates. And then another one, Theophrastus, who classified plants, and again, usefulness was one of the categories and size sometimes, and where they were growing. This is how he categorized them and how they reproduced. So that system that lasted between for, from 300 something BC up until the 16th century. Okay? And then finally, because of probably um, advances in technology, the, the use of lenses and the printing press, okay, things began to change. Okay? This is the Renaissance, okay? the dawn of kind of um, more scientific thought. And an Italian, Cespolino, um, called the first taxonomist, and he published a book categorizing 1,500 plants. It was based on growth and fruit and seed form, things that we look at today. The Swiss brothers, again, look at the beautiful illustrations. Okay? They didn't have photographs, so they would have to draw, have these beautiful woodcuts okay, in the book. And <clears throat> he tried to codify the terminology because everyone had their own names for things. So okay? it's just gonna be one of the big advances of Linnaeus later on to kind of make sure everyone knew they were talking about the same thing. Okay? Because folk names for different things, even today that causes a lot of problems. Like we have a name in Texas for a certain flower, but they might have a different name in Minnesota. English John Ray, um, had another botanical book, and he also published books on animals. <clears throat> and in France, Joseph Pouton de Tournefort um, had botanical taxonomy that came to rule until the time of Linnaeus. And some of the things that he identified, the, the genera, the genus that he identified, were based on floral characteristics. And these are still in use today, a lot of the same kind of principles of organization. Okay. So it's an interesting subject, okay, how taxonomy has changed and developed over time. And if you have any questions about the subject, Dr. Gorman would be glad to answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash. <coughs> Excuse me. And the question was, how did early people determine if a food was edible or not? And I, what little bit of research I could find on that, it was just by trial and error. You picked it up, you looked at it, you smelled of it, you took a little bite of it. If it tasted horrible, you probably didn't eat it again. But if you tasted good and later on you got sick or worse, died, your friends probably took notice of that. And that is how they determined whether it was edible or not, was trial and error. And now... Ms. Fuller is going to tell you about a more modern history. Good morning, boys and girls. Uh, we're going to be talking about Linnaeus up to the present. And uh, this is a ball python. Her name is Spring. And Spring is a diapsid. 
That means that she has two um, holes in her skull behind her eye orbit. And um, this is a characteristic of certain organisms that help them fit into the hierarchical taxonomic system. And have you ever wondered by how birds are related to reptiles? Well, we're gonna address that in just a minute. I'm gonna go ahead and put spring down. And um, we're going I'm gonna share my screen with you. I'm gonna look at some of this. So taxonomy. So what is taxonomy? Taxonomy is a combination of true Greek words, one meaning arrangement and the other one meaning method. So it's a method of arranging living organisms and um, or classifying. It's the scientific study of naming, defining, classifying groups and, of organisms based on shared characteristics. So we've got a, a couple of pictures here. On the left-hand side, you have the tree of life. And this is one way that people had of uh, designating how different organisms were related to others. Uh, then we have a picture of uh, Charles Darwin, uh, the British uh, uh, scientist who uh, gave us a lot of insight into uh, how organisms change, evolve. Then we have a picture of Julian Huxley. We're gonna be talking about the Huxleys several times. Then we have a, a diagram of a hierarchical uh, uh, system of naming things. And so if you'll notice at the top, it says life. So the things that we'll, we'll be talking about are living things. Underneath that, it says domain. And there are only three domains and that's archaea, bacteria, and you, eukarya. So, uh, I'm not going to go too much into domains. Ms. Ramirez is going to talk about that more. Now, Carl Linnaeus is the man of the day when we're talking about taxonomy. He gave us two really important tools. The first one being binomial nomenclature. Binomial means uh, two names and nomenclature means naming system. So he gave us a two name naming system that is uh, essentially universal across the scientific community. So uh, this animal you see, a bobcat, we have them here in Siegelville. We also have them where I live in Dallas and uh, his scientific name is Lynx Rufus. So the first name is the genus, the second is the species. You'll notice that it's in italics when it's in print, uh, the scientific name is in italics. And the first name uh, is um, capitalized and the species is not. The second thing he gave us was a class, a hierarchical uh, classification system. Now there's a real easy little mnemonic that you can learn that will help you remember the order they go in, which is King Philip came over from Germany Saturday. So King uh, is equal to, you just take the first letter and that would be kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So look at the darling little animal over there on the right, that's a river otter. Uh, they live here in this area. Matter of fact, one was spotted in my neighborhood last week. And um, so the kingdom is Animalia, he's an animal. Uh, the phylum is Chordata, he has a, uh, uh, spinal cord. Uh, the class is Mammalia, a mammal. Order, Carnivora, he eats meat. Uh, family, Mustelidae, he is a weasel. A genus, Lantra, and species, Canadensis. So his scientific name would be Lantra Canadensis. Now, after Linnaeus in the 1700s, we get to the 1800s and we have Charles Dar uh, Darwin and he came up with the idea of common descent and evolutionary relationships, showing how things are related by who they came from. And uh, over there on the right hand side, you see another tree of life. That one is about the pedigree of man or humans and where they came from. So um, Darwin uh, wrote a book called Origin of Species, 
And uh, he did a lot of work in the Galapagos Islands on finches and finch beaks and how they uh, evolved, how they changed according to their needs for their food. And there was a Huxley, his name was Thomas Huxley, and he was called Darwin's Bulldog. And he really um, advocated for these ideas that Darwin had come up with about evolution. So that's the first Huxley we're going to talk about. Now, uh, then we have a branch of taxonomy called cladistics. Uh, the, the word clade uh, simply means branch in Greek. In biological classification, where organisms are categorized groups based on their most recent ancestor. It's the most common method to cl classify organisms today. The famous German entomologist, Willy Enick, wrote uh, Phylogenetic Systematics in 1966, and that set the stage for the development of this taxonomic system. So here's the cladogram right here. It's very simple. It's easy to understand. The word clade was made famous in 1958 by another Huxley, Julian Huxley, the grandson of Thomas Huxley. And uh, like I said, uh, clade means branch. So this is a very simple system. Look at these branches here. Now, right here comes a group of organisms called diaspids. And all these other guys, the tuatars, the lizards, the snakes, the crocodilians, and the birds are all commonly descended from the diaspids. And um, so the tuatara, he's almost extinct. He only lives on a few little islands off the coast of New Zealand. And he's sometimes referred to as a living fossil. It's a very interesting animal. And then below him, we have the lizards. And at the end of that line, we have the snakes. And I showed you spring. Now, now when it branched off, it came down here and we came over to cro crocodilians. And those are things like crocodiles, alligators, caimans, animals like that. And look who's at the end of the line, the birds. And the birds uh, uh, are ranked with these other with these other reptile, with these reptiles, because of the presence, the diaspid uh, uh, signifying uh, element in their skull. They've got two fenestra, two holes behind the eye socket. Now, you you might say, you know, what are these holes? What purpose do these holes uh, serve? And uh, they're actually a good place for muscles to anchor, so it gives tremendous uh, jaw strength to the animals. And what's the evidence? Okay, well, initially the evidence was physical evidence. You would examine the skull of a T-Rex or uh, a bird or um, a lizard, and you would see uh, the evidence of it being a diaspid with those two holes. I'm gonna circle them right here. One, two, there's the eye socket up here. Okay, so that was physical evidence. Things have progressed tremendously and in the modern era because now we have genetic evidence. We've got DNA and we can do all kinds of studies to see how these organisms are uh, ranked by a, a common ancestor. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen with you and um, uh, I did want to mention one woman who was a contemporary of Linnaeus. Her name was Katerina Dorian, and she uh, was the first woman to name a, uh, a, a new fungal taxon. So uh, I wanted to mention her since we're uh, giving a, a, a salute to, to women scientists this week. So uh, if you have any questions about classification, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, have a delightful day. Yes, there's a question. Uh, as every day, new things are being discovered, animals, plants, and this, that, and the other. And uh, so how is it that the modern scientist, uh, what advantage does he have and basically, it is the technology that we have nowadays. I can't imagine how long it took for one of those scientists that she mentioned to discover something and do the 
beautiful drawings and things that they made because I don't have a lot of uh, artistic ability. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler hardly. And some of those pictures must have taken a long time. And how long did it take for that information to be sent basically around the world where now it's done instantly. So technology has really aided in this field. And now Mr. Monroe is going to talk to you about classification. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be looking into hierarchical uh, classification. And uh, we're going to get right into a, a short PowerPoint. And at the end of that PowerPoint, I'm going to get out two live specimens where we will use that classification system, comparing their similarities and their difference, because they are very closely related. So bear with me while I share my screen with you. Hierarchical, hierarchical uh, structure of classification of organisms. You know, uh, Ms. Fuller and Ms. Nash, they've given you the history and the present day uh, methods of classifying organisms. You know, and they all fall under the topic taxonomy. Taxonomy is the study of how scientists classify organisms. Modern classification system uses a series of levels based on structures of the organism. The more classification levels an organism shares, the more characteristics they have in common. And I want you to remember that when we compare our two live organisms at the end of my session. Levels of classification, kingdoms. There are five kingdoms, monera, mon monera protists, fungi, plants, and animals. Organisms are placed in kingdoms based on their ability to make food and the number of cells in their body. Levels of classification, phylum and phyla. In the plant kingdom, phyla are sometimes referred to as divisions. Plants are divided into vascular and non-vascular. There are 35 phyla in the animal kingdom. These are divided into vertebrates, organisms that have a backbone, and invertebrates, organisms that do not have a backbone. Levels of classification, class, order, and family. These levels become even more specific. When we make our comparisons with the two live organisms, you will see that. They include fewer organisms that have more in common as they go down the levels. Genus contains closely related organisms, is used as the first word in the organism's scientific name. Scientific name, name of an organism made up of genus and species. It's written in italics, genus, species. Genus is capitalized and species is, uh, begins with a lowercase letter. For example, wolf, we can look at that, canis, lupus. Canis is italicized and lupus is written in all lowercase letters. Now, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen with you all and we're going to look at two live organisms that have come from my lab. So. We're getting ready to stop sharing. Now, the first organism that I'm going to get out, we're going to look at, I'm going to put a pair of gloves on because they suggest that you put rubber gloves on to handle these animals simply because animals have a tendency that when they get a little nervous, guess what? One of their defense mechanisms is that they will urinate on you. And I don't feel like getting peed on this morning, okay? So I'm just gonna use one glove, that's all I really need. 
The first organism that I'm going to get out, I want you all to take a very close look at this animal, at its body structure, even its skin uh, makeup. This is a toad. Now, the amazing thing is, a lot of people, when they see these around, the first thing they want to say, oh, it's a frog. Well, guess what? They are closely related, but they are different organisms. I want you guys to look. You see the small legs, stocky body, the, yes. And the type of skin that it has, it's very rough. Even appears to have some warts on it, okay? Now, let's look at its classification. Actually, it belongs to the kingdom, uh, kingdom of Animalia. The phylum, it's Cordata. Class, it's an amphibia. The order, it's Arnura. The family that it belongs to is Bufonida. And the genus is Bufo. Bufo, Bufo. The species is also Bufo. Now, that word Bufo means rough, skin, wart-like skin, in other words. It's a reference to that. So I want you to try to remember those, those, uh, those classifications, the name, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and the species, because the next organism that I'm going to get out is closely related to the toad. In fact, sometimes, just like I stated earlier, they get the names mixed up. They see one hopping around, they want to say, oh, it's a frog. It's not really a frog. It could be a toad. Or it could be a toad. It's not really a frog. Here's another, the other organism. Now, this is an American bullfrog. Okay? And if you look closely, we see that there is a difference in the body structure and even in the body covering. The skin is very smooth. And of course, let's look at its classification. Oh, Toad is trying to get out. Let me close that lid up there. That's Hoppy the American Bullfrog. So let's talk about his classification a little bit. Now with the Bullfrog, the American Bullfrog, again, very similar to uh, the Toad, Animalia, that's the kingdom. The phylum, very similar, Chordata. The class, Amphibia, which is very similar to the toad, right? Now, here's where it gets a little, well, not really. The order is a neuro. Now, here's where it gets a little different. The family name, Rindea. And the genus species is Rihanna Castabiana. And the actual species is Rihanna castabina, Vienna. So there is a little different and they had lots of similarities until it got right down to the very level, the low levels of hierarchical classification. And that's the way it works. The further down the level they move with similarities, eventually there will be difference to give that organism maybe a different family name, a different genus species name, and a different scientific name. Hopefully I've helped you learn a little bit about hierarchical classification. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions about uh, hierarchical classification, maybe he can answer those questions for you. You guys have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And the question was, who proposed the term <clears throat> excuse me, hierarchical classification. And I'm going to have to look up and do a little more research on this because the answer is Woes and Whitaker, but I need to know more information. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear Ms. Ramirez tell us about the different economic groups. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about the six uh, kingdoms. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys, and then we'll look at a couple of live examples. So let me get the screen share started, and then we'll begin. Uh, so the first thing we're going to take a look at is our essential question for this segment. 
Uh, so essentially by the end of this segment, you guys should be able to identify the six kingdoms and describe characteristics of each. So the six kingdoms that we're gonna be going over today uh, you can take a look in this diagram. We have Archaeobacteria, Eubacteria, Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. And there's a little mnemonic uh, to help you remember those six kingdoms. You can say, um, almost every person forgets plants, animals. And you guys can create your own mnemonic to help you guys remember those six kingdoms. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you would like, you can take a moment to pause the video um, and create a little chart to help you document uh, your research and your facts that you learn about today. So we have a little chart here uh, with our six kingdoms listed. And then throughout the presentation, we're gonna be differentiating between those six kingdoms uh, based upon whether they are prokaryotes or eukaryotes, whether they are unicellular or multicellular, whether they are an autotroph or heterotroph, and then we'll give examples of each. Uh, so there's something you guys can put in your science journal or your notebook uh, to help you guys write down and organize uh, this information. And then just a quick review of where we at as far as the classification goes. Uh, so we do have three domains and domains are the largest and the most exclusive grouping. So those three domains are archaea, bacteria, and eukaryota. Now in this segment, we're gonna break it down even further and we're gonna look at the six kingdoms that fall within those larger domains. Uh, so the kingdoms that we're gonna be looking at today are Archaeobacteria, which you can see is the only kingdom in domain Archaea. So that's super easy to remember because the domain name and the kingdom name sound the same. Uh, we're gonna be looking at uh, kingdom Eubacteria and it is in domain bacteria. And that one should also be super easy for you guys to remember because they have they sound very similar. Um, and then the easiest one is eukaryota, the domain eukaryota. And that's easy to remember because the remaining four kingdoms are in the domain eukaryota. And so as you can assume, eukaryota consists of all the eukaryotes. So there are four kingdoms that are eukaryotes. So let's go over some of these vocabulary words so that you know what I'm talking about when I uh, discuss these kingdoms. So some of the words you're gonna hear me repeat quite often in this segment would be uh, prokaryote and eukaryote. So if you take a look at this first diagram at the top, you can see a chart that differentiates between those two cell types. So the main difference is that eukaryotes have a nucleus with DNA inside of it. And again, your plants, your animals, those are all gonna be eukaryotes or eukaryotic. And the way that I remember it is, I always tell students, you all are all eukaryotic. Um, so it sounds very similar to you. Um, so we are eukaryotic, our cells have a cell nucleus that houses our DNA. And then you can see some other quick differences between those. Um, and then the other words are unicellular. So uni means one. So unicellular organisms are made out of one cell. They're gonna be your simplest forms of life. Then we have multicellular. They are organisms made out of many cells. They're gonna be your more complex organisms. And then you'll hear me say the word autotroph or heterotroph. Uh, so again, autotrophs are things like your plants and trees. Uh, they're your producers. They produce or make their own food or energy using the sun sunlight and water and carbon dioxide. So auto means self. So an autotroph can make their own food uh, for themselves. Then we have heterotrophs, which would be things like animals. Heterotrophs have to eat other organisms for food or energy. We as humans are heterotrophs. We have to eat other food, other animals and plants for our energy. Our body cannot make its own energy. Uh, so those are those two, the differences between an autotroph and a heterotroph. And then I'm going to stop our screen share. We're not going to do protest just yet. We're going to do uh, the larger ones first. So I'm going to stop my screen share. And uh, the first kingdom that we're going to take a look at today is Animalia. And as its name suggests, Animalia would include animals. And they are eukaryotic. So these organisms have a nucleus that houses their DNA. 
uh, this, the cells of these organisms, they do not have a cell wall and there's no chloroplast. So remember plants and those autotrophic organisms will typically have a chloroplast. That's where the chlorophyll is for photosynthesis. Animals don't undergo photosynthesis. Uh, so there's no chloroplast in our cell. And then animals are multicellular. We are complex organisms. We are made out of many cells. And of course we are heterotrophic. Uh, so we cannot make our own energy. We have to eat other plants or animals for our energy. So I'm going to show you guys an example of an organism in Kingdom Animalia. I'm going to go ahead and pull her out. I haven't used her very often, so we're going to see how she does today. And hopefully she doesn't jump out of my little holding area. She is a rabbit. Her name is Mochi. Let me see if I can pull her up for you guys. Uh, so this is Mochi and she is a rabbit. So we know that she's in Kingdom Animalia. Uh, you learned earlier with Mr. Monroe about phylum. She's in phylum Chordata. Um, and then she's in class Mammalia. So we know that mammals are animals with fur and we can definitely tell that she is a mammal because she has fur covering her body. And then she's in the order Lagomorpha. So she is not a rodent. These are lagomorphs. And the difference between a rodent and a lagomorph has to do with their upper incisors. They actually have um, two pairs or four total. Um, and that makes them different than a rodent. Uh, so again, she's in Kingdom Animalia. She gets the name Mochi because Mochi, according to Japanese legend, is a rabbit that lives on the moon and makes mochi or rice cakes uh, for people to enjoy. And if you've ever taken a look at the moon, you might notice what looks like a rabbit on the face of the moon. And that is how she gets her name, Mochi. So I'm gonna go ahead and put our little bunny friend up and we'll take a look at our next animal. Or sorry, we'll go to our next kingdom. Our next kingdom is Kingdom Plantae. Uh, so kingdom plantae, just like animalia, is also eukaryotic. They have cell walls of cellulose, though, and they also have chloroplast. So this is where this kingdom differentiates between uh, the animalia. And then uh, plants are also multicellular. However, there is an exception. Some green algae is actually unicellular. And then, of course, we know that plants are autotrophic, so they can make their own energy. Uh, through photosynthesis, and that is where those chloroplasts come in handy uh, with the chlorophyll to help collect that sunlight uh, for that process. So I'm going to show you some examples of organisms in Kingdom Plantae. So these are some uh, various plants uh, that we have out here at the Environmental Center. We have uh, these beautiful purple flowers, which I actually like. It's henbit. Uh, it's actually a weed, so some people don't like them, but out here, um, right behind my classroom, it is covered in a sea of purple with all this hen bits. I just think it's a wonderful, a wonderful weed. <laughs> it's really pretty. And then we have um, a lot of our cedars right now. Uh, this is the Mel juniper. You can see the little pollen uh, capsules there. So those are all in Kingdom Plantae. Our next kingdom we're going to look at is Kingdom fungi. And again, it's also eukaryotic, just like our previous two kingdoms. This time, though, it has a cell wall of chitin. Most of our fungi are going to be multicellular. However, some of them, like yeast, are actually unicellular. And then a lot of people don't realize this, but fungi is actually heterotrophic. Uh, so they have a very interesting way of eating other organisms for their energy. Uh, they secrete a digestive enzyme into their food source, and that enzyme is what is breaking down their food into smaller pieces. So yes, fungi are heterotrophic. They do have to consume other organisms for their energy. So here's an example of an interesting fungi um, that I have here. I'm not entirely sure what kind this one is, but it looks pretty interesting and it's rather big. And then here's some fungi I found outside in our forest across the street. Um, this is turkey tail fungus and it gets its name because if you look really closely, it kind of looks like a turkey's tail. And so that's how this fungus gets its name. 
Uh, there's all sorts of cool looking mushrooms and fungi that we can find in our post oak preserve across the street. Uh, so it really is interesting to explore and examine all those cool fungi. Uh, so that is covering uh, kingdom animalia, kingdom plantae, and kingdom fung uh, fungi. So now I'm going to share my screen and we'll look at the other kingdoms that I don't have examples for. So let me get our screen share um, going again and let me pull up our slide. So now we're back to protist and uh, protists are very interesting. Uh, they, my rabbit just jumped out of the box. <laughs> so that's protist and um, they are eukaryotic. They have cell walls of cellulose. Uh, some of them do have chloroplasts like kingdom plantae. Uh, most are unicellular, so they're made out of one cell. However, some can be colonial, like volvox over here. And then some are multicellular. So this is a really diverse group. Some of them can be autotrophic, and then some can be heterotrophic. And you can see that some protists can be animal-like, some are plant-like, some are fungus-like, and then some are colonial, like that uh, algae volvox there. And this is one of my favorite protists that you see in the picture. This is a brain eating amoeba called Nigleria phalleri. It's a heat loving or thermophilic protist found in warm waters. And then in rare instances, it can actually infect people. So when water gets up in your nose, this protist can actually travel from your nasal passages all the way into your brain and cause encephalitis, which is in pretty much most cases is gonna be fatal or deadly. Now, again, it is very rare. In the past 10 years, there's only been less than 40 cases here in the US, uh, but it does happen. So just last year in September of 2020, the state of Texas had a uh, do not uh, use water order for eight counties in Texas near Brazoria and Lake Jackson. And unfortunately, a six-year-old child ended up passing away due to infection from this protest. So it does happen, but again, it is super rare. Um, so that's protist. Our next one is eubacteria. And this one's another interesting one. So eubacteria is also a prokaryote. It has cell walls with peptidoglycan. It is unicellular. And some of them can be autotrophic and some of them can be heterotrophic. Now this example that I have here is one that you guys probably know of. It's Yersinia pestis, better known as what caused the Black Death or uh, the bubonic plague. Um, it is a gram-negative bacteria. And then some of the pictures that I have here, you can just see that this, um, this bacteria was spread from infected rodents. A flea would bite the rodent, and then that flea would then bite a human and then infect them as well. And then uh, here in the bottom picture is from the Paris catacombs. So in 1347, Paris had lost over 50,000 people that's about a third of its population to the bubonic plague. Um, so it's estimated that some of the skeletal remains that were later dug up and put into the Paris catacombs were actually victims of the plague. So I actually had a chance to go there last year and it was rather interesting to learn the history uh, behind some of the skeletons that were put there and some of the surrounding cemeteries that were there as well. And then here we have a just something typical that a, a doctor back then would wear uh, during the plague. So back then they thought illness was caused by bad air. And so they would wear these elongated masks. They would put uh, cloth or cotton balls toward the end of the mask and fill it with aromatic herbs to kind of clean the air uh, so that they wouldn't get sick. So it's interesting to see how uh, people have dealt with pandemics in the past. And then our last one is Kingdom Archaeobacteria. It is also prokaryotic. They have cells with peptidoglycan. They are unicellular. They are autotrophic or heterotrophic. This is an interesting group because these organisms live in extreme environments. So you can see there's the extreme heat lovers, the thermophiles, uh, the extreme acid lovers, the acidophiles, paleophiles, think of like salt brines. Uh, those would be the salt lovers. Uh, so these can live in a extreme harsh conditions. And then our uh, little review chart for you guys, um, you can see here that the only two kingdoms that are prokaryotic are eubacteria and archaeobacteria. The remaining four are eukaryotes, therefore they are in domain uh, eukaryotus.
So that's a, just a quick visual to help you differentiate between those kingdoms. And then I have a quick challenge for you guys. Take a look at the pictures that you guys see um, on the slide and see if you can identify the kingdom for each organism and then justify your answer. So there's some cool organisms that are listed um, in this slide for you guys to research and figure out their kingdoms and why they belong there. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop our screen share. And that is all I have for you guys today on the kingdoms. We're gonna pass it to Dr. Gorman and he's gonna uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And we do have a question. How many plants have been identified? And the Royal Botanical Gardens in 2015 estimated that there are 390,900 plants that have been identified. Our earlier question was uh, new plants were being identified every day. How do we pass the information on? And, and also in 2015, when this report was made, there were 2,034 new plants added. So there's new plants being added every day. And also the same uh, people who did this report said that 21% of our plants are in danger of becoming extinct. And now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students recognize the importance of a standardized taxonomy system to the scientific community, learn to categorize organisms using a classification system based on similarities and differences shared among groups and compared characteristics of different groups, taxonomic groups. Uh, Ms. Nash told you about early history. Ms. Fuller discussed late history. Mr. Monroe did classification and Ms. Fuller, uh, Ms. Ramirez just got through doing her program and now we want to thank you. How did we do? If you would, teachers, fill out www.tiny.ccec feedback form and send it to us. We would appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. And more importantly, students, have a great life.